And thank you, Donna, for uh, for the kind introduction. As uh, Donna mentioned, I'm uh, a practicing orthopedic trauma surgeon in the Melbourne, Florida area, and that's been the focus of my practice for, for over 20 years. Um, I've seen a lot of changes that have come uh, through uh, with uh, not only implant technology, but with table technology. Uh, and I was uh, very pleased to be able to have the opportunity to incorporate the HANA table uh, in our uh, uh, kind of our toolbox, if you will, uh, for addressing patients uh, with uh, proximal femur fractures. So I guess by design, we have to put the disclaimer. Everybody sees this. Uh, We'll go quickly through that and move on. So um, the purpose of this talk was really to try to stay focused and really provide more opportunity for uh, attendees to, to ask questions. You may have some uh, technical issues in the operating room or some questions regarding uh, how to make things more efficient, uh, reductions uh, uh, easier to achieve, and we'll have uh, ample opportunity to be able to, to address those questions. But specifically for the, uh, for the objectives of this talk, to really look at some of the more challenging types of hip fractures uh, that, uh, that we see in the operating room, uh, knowing that there is an entire spectrum uh, that uh, we are faced with on a, literally on a daily basis. Uh, and then look at where we are with the HANA table as far as offering solutions, not only for uh, difficult patients from, let's say, a body habitus or a difficult fracture pattern problem, but also uh, just uh, difficult reductions and how to be able to obtain and maintain those reductions as we go through the actual procedure itself. So we know that in, in the proximal femur, there's an entire spectrum uh, of injuries for something as really simple, as subtle as a, a really minimally in, uh, valgus impacted femoral neck fracture that you have to get a, actually CAT scan and do a, a zoom in to actually see the fracture. The patient presents with some hip pain after a non-traumatic uh, you know, non type of fall. Um, not a lot of debate on the reductions or necessarily a technique on how to take care of this type of injury, but you get the other end of the spectrum. So you have very poor osteoporotic bone, uh, a sick uh, patient with multiple medical comorbidities where you're trying to really minimize your surgical footprint, if you will, uh, to maximize the actual quality of reduction and get that patient down the road to recovery as quickly and as safely as possible. We also know that there's a lot of challenges that go beyond just the actual x-ray or the CAT scan uh, with things like patients' body habitus, uh, patients with unusual clinical scenarios like an amputee or bilateral amputee you see here. Uh, and then in my world, these polytraumatized patients that will have multiple lower extremity injuries with an ipsilateral hip fracture uh, that you're trying to stage and reconstruct them appropriately, uh, facing the challenges that you don't normally see on a, on a daily basis with your typical geriatric fracture. So what we did is we put together a case example, and we did a, a cadaveric lab uh, creating a, an atrogenic fracture to try to kind of demonstrate the, the utility of the HANA table and how it really functions as a surgical assist for me. Uh, that's, that's really kind of how I look at the table and what, it's, uh, what it has as far as the capabilities and what it can deliver to you in the operating room. So this is your standard kind of uh, intertrochanteric basal cervical uh, uh, proximal femur hip fracture. So we go through steps. You know, this is kind of what you would be going through on a routine basis in the operating room uh, as that uh, patient's uh, pre-opt and then comes into the, the surgical theater. So how do I go about doing the setup? So first and foremost, we have just kind of your initial boot placement. Uh, the uh, anchoring system for the boots is uh, uh, superior to whatever else is out on the market, and I've used a lot of different types of products. Uh, the padding is excellent. It really helps protect the skin. I usually go the extra mile, and you can see um, where we use uh, like a Coban type of wrap uh, to prevent any uh, friction interface with the skin just to kind of do that proverbial belt and suspenders and make sure we don't cause any atrogenic skin tears. But the boots anchor the feet appropriately, and then we get that patient positioned on the table supine, uh, which is my favorite position on how to take care of these patients uh, and kind of go through the initial setup. So from there, we start to do some subtle things, and the table allows us to do that. So we're really kind of setting ourselves up for uh, a better surgical access and, at least in my opinion, a better opportunity for surgical success by shifting the patient uh, to the affected side to providing for that abduction of the torso as well as the uh, appropriate positioning of the lower extremity. That helps significantly with your targeting in the proximal femur. It helps significantly with your access to the appropriate starting portal, uh, and the bed really provides that opportunity to be able to do that based upon its geometry as well as this adjustability. One of the things I think it's kind of important is to make sure that you do have the torso and particularly the ipsilateral upper extremity appropriately moved out of the operative uh, approach, if you will. And we do that with a, just a simple wrist tether. Um, the bed has the opportunity for the well arm to be positioned that appropriately. We can see this kind of abduction uh, uh, and uh, 
uh, hip displacement that can take place on the table. And then we take that arm, we put it over the chest. There it goes. Uh, again, allowing us a really nice corridor, a really nice area to access the proximal femur. Again, making it much uh, less cumbersome. Uh, a, lot of some, uh, a lot of the in initial tables I was using, you're always kind of fighting the side of the table to try to get uh, the appropriate starting portal. And this really gives you the opportunity to have a much more uh, unencumbered access to the proximal femur. So but what about leg positioning? So this is kind of crucial, and, and I've learned this over the years. Uh, as a resident, I initially was trained in using the well leg holder, where the hip and the knee are flexed and brought out of position, and then the C-arm kind of comes in through the, uh, through the groin area. Uh, I found that to be really challenging, particularly in patients with a larger body habitus. What that tends to do is it tends to take the pelvis and shift and rotate the pelvis, and so you're not necessarily in a collinear fashion with the proximal femur, and it makes it much more difficult to access the proximal femur. So by putting the legs in a scissored position, which is really simple to do on the HANA table, you not only anchor the pelvis and keep that pelvis from rotating, but, but you also don't encumber in any way, shape, or form your imaging of the proximal femur, either in the AP or the lateral views. And so as a kind of a routine recipe that I have in taking care of the proximal femur fractures, I usually go through initial C-arm assessment, obviously to looking at what our reduction looks like, but also making sure that you can actually visualize everything with the C-arm, that no surprises, uh, that there is no uh, uh, encumbrance, if you will, from the actual table itself, which you won't see. And so this is a video that we did uh, in a cadaver lab that kind of goes through what that looks like as far as seeing what we can see. We did speed it up for the sake of time, but what we'll do here is we'll mark the kind of the, the version, if you will, uh, of, the, uh, of the neck itself. So we can kind of mark that angle and then take a marking pencil and mark the skin. Uh, and we measure from the top of the, top of the trochanter down to the lesser trochanter. And so that gives us a reference throughout the case. So now we know kind of where we are with the proximal aspect of the femur, the tip of the greater trochanter, the lesser trochanter, and then the version, as far as Amy is concerned, of the femoral neck. Uh, and also that we can actually see what we want to see once everything is prepped and draped. Similarly, we do this on the lateral. So we're slightly off axis. We can kind of see where our uh, femoral version is, where our targeting is going to be, and then we have that as well. So when all said and done, we have a reference in our minds of where we are. We know that we can see everything and visualize everything, and there's no uh, um, shadow and there's no uh, uh, inability to, to have the CRM do what we need it to do as far as its targeting is concerned. Uh, and we have those references now put in place throughout the entire case. And so this is the draping that we go through. So um, this is a draping that we did uh, in the uh, cadaver lab just to kind of show what things look like underneath. I tend to use the shower curtain, but a little different. I don't hang the shower curtain up over the top. I drape it over the patient. Uh, that does allow you to visualize the uh, well leg, particularly when the C-arm is coming in. And if you've had a C-arm tech that doesn't necessarily have a lot of uh, experience, you worry about potentially harming the down leg when it's in the scissor position. So this is just a way to make sure that you can check and uh, cause no harm to the patient. Um, and again, everything is draped and draped sterilely. This is what it looks like in the operating room. So uh, you know, we have the barrier drapes around the operative site. Uh, we can see that the well leg is well visualized and then it's not in the way of the CRM itself. And this gives us uh, full access. So we're not fighting the CRM coming in with the actual uh, 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 shower curtain drape. The CRM is draped sterilely. And if you look closely, you can kind of see where our markings are up on the proximal femur as we go through make sure that we have those targets uh, in position throughout the entire case. So here's kind of sort of the subtleties of where the table really functions as, as an assist or as a tool to assist uh, in the actual reduction. So we're going to go through and show this a little bit sped up. So we did create the iatrogenic fraction. We placed the nail, and you can see that we're not reduced. So what the can you pause that right there? OK, that's fine right there. So what this allows is it allows uh, your assistant in the operating room or your circulating nurse or one of the other techs in the operating room. Now you can actually go through some subtle adjustments of the patient's proximal femur and assist yourself with the reduction. And so we're following things on C-arm. Our device uh, is inserted as far as a uh, cephalomedullary nail in this case. And now we can control rotation and we can control distraction to, try to as I like to say, kind of dial in our reduction. Uh, and uh, go ahead and restart the video. And so we're controlling rotation and looking at what that looks like with the, uh, with the proximal femur. 
and then we can also place our uh, lag screw. And now we say we still have a gap, and now we go through the proverbial compression that you like to get in the proximal femur. But we can dial in that compression with the device itself, and then we can also take some of the subtle compression off by unwinding that with the table and get an anatomical reduction. And that's one of the beauties of, of what you have here is that you can maintain gross traction, you can do subtle adjustments, you can provide for implant placement, and then you can still make some adjustments after the fact to make sure that you actually have the uh, anatomical reduction that you're trying to achieve uh, in the operating room. So just kind of uh, to, to round things out, some of the other things that you're able to do in the operating room to assist with the reduction, um, particularly as the table gives you that uh, accessibility from a fluoroscopy perspective as well as from a surgical approach perspective, doing some things that help reduce the calcar to make sure you have a much more stable reduction and much more confidence in ambulating that patient right after surgery. And this is something, again, that you can do where you see uh, these images here. I mean, no encumbrance whatsoever as far as the visualization of the proxima femur, the visualization of your implant, more importantly, the assessment and the visualization of your reduction. And then finally for closure. So this is another nice part about the table, again, that you can make these adjustments after the fact. So as you can imagine, you're usually pulling some level of traction for to provide for reduction. You're manipulating the proximal femur. So there's a lot of tension on the IT band. Okay. You also have the well leg that's down, so there's an extension component to the well leg, and you worry about potential femoral uh, nerve traction. So you can eliminate all those as you go through the actual closing process so that you can take gross traction off, you can abduct the leg and bring it back into position, and you can take the well leg and bring it up out of that extended position to protect the femoral nerve, and then now you can actually go through the simple closure part, not fighting uh, the excess traction or any kind of uh, malpositioning of the patient.